All right, moving on then to lecture number five in Rudolf Steiner's uh, analysis of the gospel according to John. Um, <clears throat> now here he starts out, uh, he sort of goes back uh, to the beginning. Uh, he's already talked about the uh, raising of Lazarus and its significance coming in the middle of the text. And now here <clears throat> he goes back and he talks about first uh, the first of the signs, which is the wedding at Cana, which is in Galilee. And all of that's significant. Every detail is significant in these texts. Um, and his, his and Nathaniel's uh, mutual recognition as initiates, he says here. So um, he meets the first two of the disciples, uh, Peter, Simon Peter and Andrew. Uh, same as in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, and then Philip also, which is the same. And then instead of Philip's brother Bartholomew, we get this individual named Nathaniel. And Christ says that, or rather Steiner says that, uh, there, and he borrows this from Mithraism, the seven grades of initiation in Mithraism, which was uh, a primary competitor for Christianity amongst, uh, but it was only for Roman soldiers, um, that the first grade of initiation was called the raven, Corax, uh, the second that of the occultist, the third of the warrior, the fourth that of the lion. And then he says, amongst different peoples who still felt a kind of blood relationship as the expression of their group soul, the fifth degree was designated by the name of the folk itself. Thus, among the Persians, for example, an initiate of the fifth degree was called, in an occult sense, uh, a Persian. And so, uh, in this case, when he sees Nathaniel, um, he says to him, uh, Philip, Philip uh, says to Nathaniel, Hey, look, I'm, check out this uh, new prophet guy. And Nathaniel says, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And then Philip says, Just come and see. And then so Jesus saw Nathaniel coming to him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. So he immediately recognizes him as a fifth, a fifth grade initiate, an Israelite. So he's still embedded in the group soul. Remember last time that we were talking about with Steiner, the whole point of the incarnation of Christ is to bring the I am, to sunder the individual ego from the group soul and the old tribal ways of doing things. Um, and then he, Nathaniel says to him, how do you know me? And Jesus says, well, before Philip called you, uh, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Almost like the Buddha under the Bodhi tree. He recognizes him uh, as the spiritual initiate under the tree. Now, the significance of this is that recognizing Nathaniel as, as a fifth grade initiate, where he is still in the mode of the representative of his people, of, of the folk soul of his people, then we move to uh, the marriage at Cana, it's significant that this takes place in Galilee. Galilee is in the north, Judea is in the south, um, and the fate of Galilee was, of course, that it was destroyed by the Assyrians in the 8th century BC. They came in, um, I think about 722, they came in and deported all the populations of Israel, of the north, Israel in the north, Judah in the south. So they take Israel, and they never are brought back. And so the northern populations are not racially pure Jews. They're, they're intermixed. They're completely intermixed. Um, unlike the, the fate of the Hebrews in the south who were taken also by the Babylonians, but then they were restored by the Persians and brought back. So they regard themselves as authentically Jewish, uh, and the northerners, the Galileans, as not really Jews at all, and especially not the Samaritans either. Um, so we have this idea, Steiner says, with regard to um, love. It begins at the animal level with simply sexual reproduction. But over time, as the earth has evolved, um, it's gotten wider and wider and wider. At first, the, the marriages would have been uh, in between, would have taken place within a specific tribe. Uh, so this would have been endogamy. You marry an, uh, another member of your tribe. Then exogamy comes in, and let's say the tribe of Dan can marry someone from the tribe of Asher, let's say, but they're still within the 12 tribes of Judaism. They're, they're, they're still within uh, a group soul mentality, and so on. And it gets wider and wider and wider. And so 
it's significant that this marriage takes place in a multi-ethnic place where tribal bonds have been broken in Galilee, in the north. That's point number one that he makes about uh, the geographic location of the marriage at Cana. Now then, um, the first of the miracles that he performs in John is the transformation, and here's a, an image, an early 19th century painting by uh, Julius uh, Schnorr, of the transformation of six jugs of water into wine. Uh, they're at the marriage, and Jesus' mother comes to him and says, we don't have any wine, we just have water. And he says, woman, what am I to do with thee? But then he goes ahead and does it anyway. He transforms the, the water into wine. Now, there are a couple of ways of reading this. Steiner's way is, is rather idiosyncratic and surprising. One way is to simply say, because we've already met John the Baptist and his ancient way of um, initiating people through the process of baptism, immersing one into the abyss, and then one comes out cleansed of one's sins or cleansed of one's impurities. Um, and the Baptist saying, um, if I am to, uh, um, if, if he is to wax, then I must wing. So, so a better one will come after me, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So in other words, wine will become part of the Eucharist. So we'll drink, uh, we'll eat the body of Christ through the, the wafer, and we'll drink the uh, his blood symbolically in the form of wine. <clears throat> so it sounds like that it's a transition from John the Baptist's way of uh, initiating individuals to Christ's way. So that's one way of reading it, and that's the way that it would have occurred to me and probably many commentators. But now uh, Steiner says, actually, so with regard to the group soul now, um, the physical body had also to be prepared uh, over the course of time to receive the I am principle, the principle of the ego. And what alcohol does, uh, the Dionysian cult of alcohol, is it sunders the individual from the divine. It sunders the individual from the group, from the collective, and it inhibits uh, messages from the divine, let's say. It, it, it cuts one off. But this, he says, was a necessary phase in the history of humanity, from Noah, who's the first wine drinker, down through Dionysus, uh, it was absolutely necessary for the reception of the body's uh, principle of the I am that Christ would bring, and bring to perfection. There had to be a sense in which the individual ego began to feel isolated. Uh, sort of like in the myth of Dionysus, when Dionysus is torn apart, all the pieces are sundered apart. Um, they're, they're, they're broken. They no longer form <clears throat> a single group soul, a single group unity. And so the, the, the message is at Cana that uh, the alcohol was a necessary stage, and Steiner regards it as a degeneracy. Uh, alcohol is a degeneracy into materialism, but that it was a stage that had to be gone through in order to um, make humanity receptive to, to the Christ, to the coming in of the Christ being. Um, and then he talks about this idea where Christ is constantly saying in this text, I and the Father are one. But Steiner says what he's really saying is, every one of you, you, all of your egos, are fragments of the divine. You are all consubstantial with the Father, with the God being, as in fact we are. Uh, from what I've learned from my uh, researches into the afterlife and spirituality, the God being, uh, this prime source energy, is constantly exhaling souls as individual fragments of itself. So in actual, in actual fact, we each one of us can say, I and the Father are one. So there's that way of looking at it. But there's another aspect to this too, and that is to say that when the soul incarnates, not all of it incarnates, only a certain percentage of it, depending on what amount of energy it thinks it will need in order to deal with the karmic life tasks that it has agreed to. Um, one individual may um, agree to incarnate with 80% of their energy because they're going to have a particularly difficult life, so they're going to need a lot of energy, so the 80% of it. So the higher self remains behind. So and it goes dormant uh, on the other side, is my understanding. It can still converse, it can still talk, but uh, it doesn't really participate in any of the activities. It, it's, its energy is concentrated 
on its incarnation as in a physical body. So there's also that distinction between uh, the, the lower ego and the higher ego. Uh, but Christ has come to say that the higher ego, everyone is in possession of the higher ego. Everyone is a manifestation uh, of a higher ego that exists in another dimension. And Christ is pretty intense. As you, as you read through this gospel, <clears throat> the writer um, of the gospel, has, his portrait of Christ is, is a very intense, uh, metaphysically focused individual. This isn't the, it's not even really the same Christ that sits in, uh, in Matthew and gives the Sermon on the Mount and says, you know, things like, neither a borrower nor a lender be. I know that's from Shakespeare, but th things like that. Um, instead, he's constantly saying, no, I and the Father are one, and your failure to believe that is your loss. Uh, that's too bad for you, because um, I am the, the light of the world, and without me there is no light. I am the incarnation of the light of the world. And he's, we constantly have this metaphysical opposition between light and darkness, he is the one who has brought the light into the world. And for Steiner, Steiner interprets this in his own idiosyncratic way as the light of the world representing, I am the I am, I am the ego, uh, the incarnation of the human ego that will uh, bring the light to the world because it was absolutely necessary for the West to develop the sense of the ego, the sense no, sundering uh, the ego from the group soul um, <clears throat> and he says that um, when at the wedding at Cana, his mother comes to him and says, "Hey, hey we're out of we're we're out of wine," and he replies, um, "Woman, what have I to do with thee?" Steiner says, um, <clears throat> "What he really is saying, what I have now to accomplish has still to do with ancient times, with me and thee, for my proper time has not yet come, when wine will be transformed back again into water." In other words, there's this idea of, of an original, profound emergence of human beings from water. All life comes from water, as we know. Um, and then a gradual, dis but also the connotations that in Atlantean times, for, for Steiner, in Atlantean times, human beings still had a very close relationship with the gods. They were clairvoyant. Um, the divine was easy to access. But there wasn't a sense of, of, of an ego. The ego was something that had to be developed over time. And, but first there was this necessary period of degeneracy in which alcohol was introduced to sunder the individual from the group. And then once the, in the West especially, once the ego is developed, uh, as, as I think we can say that it, it has achieved its telos, the West has developed the ego in a way that is more sophisticated than any other civilization in history ever has, um, once it has achieved that, then transforming it back into water means uniting it back with the spirit. So we can bring back in reincarnation, the reality of reincarnation. We can bring back in the reality of communication with the gods, gods plural, um, without having to just simply do this silly new age thing and dissolve the ego, uh, blindly import Indian metaphysical ideas that are all about dissolving the ego and thinking that that somehow is compatible with the West mission. It's not. Uh, Indian yoga has its purpose, and it had its historical role, but its task can no longer, its task is just simply completely at odds with, with what the West karma is with the development of the ego. The ego is there for a reason. Uh, the development of the ego, of the individual, as a metaphysically unique species unto himself has been the West's primary task. And India, Indian yoga is specifically designed to dismantle the ego, to destroy it, wipe it out. Like a, the metaphor they give is the salt doll walking back into the ocean. That's not what we're doing in the West. That's not what's going on. We're bringing reincarnation back in as part of the second religiousness that, that Spengler predicted and that Steiner predicted as the age of the art the age of the Archangel Michael. So that is what is happening, but the ego has to be retained. You can't use alien metaphysical systems that are designed specifically to wipe it out. That won't work. Um, so the marriage of East and West that Steiner, I think, is doing uh, is very appropriate for, for our current situation culturally. Um, all right, so that's uh, lecture number five.
on Steiner's analysis of the Gospel of, of, of John.